to give his inaugural lecture. I'm stopping sharing my screen. Monty, if you're ready to go. Yeah. Cheers. Hello, okay, so um, I don't know whether to put the video on or not. Thanks for um, asking me to talk today. Um, and um, what I thought I'd do is uh, tell people a bit about my story, because I think uh, I know everybody obviously wants to hear about that. So when I was a registrar, I, I did a PhD, but when I uh, became a consultant, at least initially, I wasn't an academic consultant. Uh, I was a, mainly just a clinical consultant specializing in Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. But I was seeing a heck of a lot of patients uh, with uh, these conditions. And it was in around, uh, I think, 2012 that I started to become interested in why so many of my Parkinson's patients were complaining of pain. It seemed to me like the vast majority of Parkinson's patients were complaining of pain. And, and this was, in many cases, their most troublesome symptom. So I kind of spoke to uh, colleagues at, at conferences and things because really there was nothing at the time in the textbooks or in the journals to suggest that the pain was, was a symptom in Parkinson's, but it seemed to me very common. I spoke to uh, colleagues at conferences and things and asked, you know, had they seen lots of people with Parkinson's who seemed to be complaining of pain? And the general consensus was that, well, yeah, pain is quite common in Parkinson's, but really it's due to the mobility issues causing musculoskeletal problems. So for example, people with Parkinson's, they walk with a, a stoop posture and that puts stress on the bones and joints in the lower back and so they get back pain. People with Parkinson's have stiffness and slowness in the muscles of the arms around the shoulder, for example, and that causes the shoulder to freeze up and so you get shoulder pain. And there was this whole idea that really pain in Parkinson's was simply caused by the mobility issues leading to uh, musculoskeletal pain. But that didn't really seem to be uh, borne out by what I was seeing in clinic. I was seeing loads of people with really very mild Parkinson's, very few mobility issues, and yet pain was a, a dominant symptom. And so I started to read around this area, read about sort of research and pain and that sort of thing, and came to the conclusion that pain in Parkinson's was probably largely due to what is called central sensitization. So what that means is if you've got like a mild amount of uh, tissue damage, for example, a bit of mild osteoarthritis or a mild injury, such as we see in the picture here, but then the pain signal becomes amplified on its way up to the brain. So when you actually experience the pain, it's much more uh, severe than it, than it should be. And if you read the literature, there's actually quite a lot of potential reasons why you might get central sensitization and this amplification of pain signals in Parkinson's disease. There's loss of various neurotransmitters, for example. We know these neurotransmitters are part of the brain's kind of analgesic pain control system. And so when you lose them, you would predict that the pain signals would be amplified and you would get uh, central sensitization of pain. And so I decided to initially set up a little pilot study at Salford Royal to investigate this. And then that turned into a grant application to Parkinson's UK, which we were lucky enough to get funded. And then that turned into this Parkinson's pain study, which was a, a research study was running at over 80 centers around the UK and which overall recruited more than 2000 participants at basically investigating pain in Parkinson's. So this is a big change for me. One minute, I'm a clinical neurologist not doing any research. The next minute, I find myself as chief investigator of one of the largest ever uh, studies in Parkinson's disease, running at over 80 centers around the UK. So it was a big kind of steep learning curve for me, big change in my kind of role, shall we say. And so to, uh, to cut a, a long story short, we, we published our first paper a, a couple of years ago from this study. Uh, we recruit, the first paper was on almost 2,000 uh, participants. Uh, these were people with predominantly early Parkinson's, so most of them less than five years from diagnosis, most of them fairly mild mobility issues at that time. And what we showed there was that 85% of participants were reporting pain at the time of assessment, so really, really high, much higher than any of the textbooks would tell you. But maybe you're not interested in any pain, you know, you stubbed your toe this morning and it's a little bit sore and uh, we're not interested in minor things like that. If we define uh, moderate to severe pain 
as having a visual analog score of five or more, and that's how we and others would define moderate to severe pain, we still see that 42% of these unselected people from all around the country with fairly early Parkinson's, they are complaining of moderate to severe pain. So this is a really important symptom in Parkinson's disease, and we completely neglected it uh, as, a, as a symptom for, for the last 200 years or so. And I think this, this uh, publication has helped to put pain as an important symptom in Parkinson's on the map, really. And of course, everybody thinks pain is due to mobility issues causing musculoskeletal pain. So we looked at that. We looked to see whether there was any correlation between the severity of pain and the severity of mobility problems. And actually, we get no correlation at all. Anyone who knows anything about statistics will know that if you've got 2,000 people in a study, it's actually quite hard not to get a positive p-value. But yet, we see no correlation at all between these two symptoms. So this whole kind of idea that the mobility problems are causing the pain is just not borne out at all by the data. And we think that this study really provides strong evidence that pain in Parkinson's is largely due to central sensitization. So the next thing I wanted to do was try and prove whether you get amplification, central sensitization of pain signals in Parkinson's disease. Um, I collaborated with Anthony Jones, who many of you will know, a professor of pain uh, here in Manchester. And Anthony's got expertise in central sensitization as it applies to other pain conditions, such as um, fibromyalgia, such as osteoarthritis, and so on. So I went to him with this plan to have a look for whether you get central sensitization of pain signals in Parkinson's and whether that might explain why pain is so common in this condition. So we applied again to Parkinson's UK and we're lucky enough to, to be successful in that grant application. And you can see in, the, in this picture here, Sarah Martin, who was my PhD student on this project. And Sarah's pretty lucky really, because unlike other PhD students, Sarah gets to blast her PhD supervisor with a painful laser. If you look at my arm, you can see a little red light there. I don't know if you can see my, my mouse cursor or not. Uh, and Sarah's about to press a button and blast me with this painful laser. She presses the button and I get blasted by the laser. And it's a little bit like, for example, you're frying an egg and a bit of oil spurts up onto the skin. It's a little bit like a, a sensation like that. And so what we did in this study is we took uh, 25 people with Parkinson's and 25 age match controls. We blast them all with this laser to cause a, a modest uh, painful stimulus. And then we measure the response as it comes into the brain using a technique called source localization EEG. And what we wanted to do was see is a response to the same pain signal different uh, in people with Parkinson's compared to people without Parkinson's who were otherwise kind of similar age and matched. And indeed, that's what we see if we take the pain signal in those uh, of the controls and subtracted off the pain signal uh, of people with Parkinson's, we see that you do indeed get this increased pain response in people with Parkinson's to the same laser uh, stimulus. And this green area is the area of the brain where the response is increased in Parkinson's disease. And this area uh, is mainly an area of the brain called the cingulate cortex. And we know this part of the brain is involved in the sensation and perception of pain. And it's actually the part of the brain which deals with the emotional response to pain. So for example, you might be playing football uh, and you might uh, get whacked in the face by a, by a ball. Uh, and um, maybe it's, it should be quite sore, but because you're kind of focused on the match or so on, you don't really experience the pain much at all. But then the opposite scenario might be that someone's taking your blood and you absolutely hate getting blood taken and they put this tiny little needle into your arm and it's not really sore, but because of the emotional nature uh, of the stimulus, it feels agony to you. And, th and that's this emotional response to pain, which is basically occurs in this cingulate cortex. And that's the part of the brain where the pain signal is amplified in Parkinson's disease. So this is going a long way to explaining why pain is so common. I also, as part of this study, collaborated with Nigel Williams, who's a professor of genetics at Cardiff, uh, to look and see if there's any genetic factors which might predispose <clears throat> people with Parkinson's to get to develop pain. So we looked to see whether there are any genetic polymorphisms, that means little genetic variations, which mean if you've got these variations and then you get Parkinson's, would influence whether you get pain or not. 
And what we see uh, on this diagram here, uh, again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we get a genome-wide significant hit. And that means a p-value of, of less than 10 to the minus 9. So an incredibly significant result. And speaking to Nigel, uh, who is obviously a professor of genetics, it's quite rare to get such a genome-wide significant hit in a study of less than 2,000 participants. So this is very significant. If you have this gene or a small polymorphism in this gene, and then you get Parkinson's, you are much more likely to develop pain. So what is this gene? It's a gene called TRIPMATE. And it's actually involved in the perception of pain because this gene is an endogenous cannabinoid receptor. It's part of the brain's kind of receptors for cannabinoids. And we know that cannabinoids are involved in the experience of pain. And so this really opens the way for uh, developing a cannabinoid based treatments as a potentially a, a specific targeted treatment uh, for pain in Parkinson's. And that's something that we are, are working on at the moment. So that's all I want to say about the pain research today. Uh, but also, it's when you start as a clinical academic neurologist, when you kind of put your toe into the water and start um, publishing papers and start becoming known as someone that is involved in research, loads of potentials for collaboration develop. There's loads of people in Manchester who want to collaborate with us. And when they find out about us, they approach me and, and I find out about them and I approach them. And over the years, many, many great collaborations have developed. And unfortunately, I don't really have time in this fairly short talk to, to go through all of them, which <clears throat> would really be a talk in and of themselves. Just to kind of list some here, I've got a really a nice collaboration with uh, Professor Reyes Malik uh, and also Hui Lim uh, and Chris Kobalecki working on this study. And we're using, uh, trying to develop corneal confocal microscopy as a new biomarker in uh, Parkinson's disease. We've also got a really cool project, a collaboration with uh, Ian Lorem at MMU, uh, looking at a new way to understand how the brain controls movement. And we're doing stuff like recording directly from the subthalamic nucleus in people with Parkinson's having a deep brain stimulation surgery. So it's a really uh, exciting uh, project to be involved with. I've got a lot, lot of uh, deep brain stimulation research that I'm involved with, a collaboration with UCL and King's, and also more of a pan-European collaboration as well. We published a load of, of nice uh, papers on new ways to use uh, deep brain stimulation therapy. And we found out this week that we've been successful uh, in a joint application between myself uh, and UCL uh, of a, a, an NHL grant to uh, investigate deep brain stimulation as a treatment for Tourette syndrome. So I'm excited to, to get that project off the ground soon. And we have a nice collaboration with the uh, computer science department at MMU, trying to get more information out of ultrasound images using machine learning, where we can see features on the ultrasound which are not, um, uh, not, not really recognizable without these tools. And this is hopefully going to be a really good uh, diagnostic tool. But as I said, I don't really have time to go through all of these studies in this fairly short talk. I can probably only talk about one other study apart from the pain study. And if it can only be one other one, it, it kind of has to be this one here. So this picture is taken in uh, 1982. Uh, and the lady in the middle of the picture is Joy Milne. And on the side is her husband, Les Milne. So Joy Milne is what's called a super smeller. These people exist in the population and they have better senses of smell than the rest of us. So often they work in industries such as the wine industry, the perfume industry, and so on. And Joy notices around this time, she notices a, a funny smell on her husband, Les, what she describes as a musky smell. Not an unpleasant smell, but just, just a bit different. She asked Les if he's changed his aftershave, if he's changed his um, shower gel, and he goes, no, of course I haven't. And, and he starts getting a bit irritated by these questions, and so she kind of stops asking them uh, eventually. But the smell continues, and then 12 years later, Les gets diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So that's the key thing that um, Les had to smell, Joy could smell the smell 12 years before he developed Parkinson's disease. We move forward a bit further to uh, 15 further years later to 2009. Uh, Les is a bit more disabled by his Parkinson's now. Uh, Joy and Les are members of Parkinson's UK. And it's at Parkinson's UK meetings and also at um, um, clinics where, Les, where Joy and Les go uh, together 
that Joy notices that the same musky smell is present on other people with Parkinson's disease. So in 2012, uh, Joy speaks to uh, this chap here, Tilo Kunath, who's a, a Parkinson's researcher in, in Edinburgh uh, and a friend of mine. And um, Joy says to Tilo, do, do people with Parkinson's have a, have a funny musky smell? Because I've not read about this, but clearly to me, they do. So Tilo too says, well, nobody's heard of this, but it's interesting, let's, let's test it out. And so what he did was he got um, 12 people uh, to wear t-shirts overnight, six people with Parkinson's disease and six uh, age match controls to wear t-shirts overnight. Then he coded all the t-shirts and gave them to Joy and said, okay, if you can smell Parkinson's disease, tell me which of these t-shirts was worn by people with Parkinson's and which without. So Joy got all of the Parkinson's t-shirts correct and she got five out of the six control t-shirts correct. The only one that she got wrong was one of the controls she said actually had Parkinson's disease. So really there was something in this. Joy's incredibly accurate. She got 11 out of 12 t-shirts correct and we thought this is, is pretty impressive really and certainly something that's worth investigating further. But what about this guy, this control that she said had Parkinson's? Uh, this is a guy called Ken and it turns out nine months after the study he starts to develop some mobility problems and he gets diagnosed as having Parkinson's disease and they contacted us to tell us that this had happened. So Joy was able to diagnose him nine months before he had any symptoms. It was almost too good to be true. So it was at this stage that uh, Tilo Kunath contacted Perdita Barron, who's a professor of chemistry here uh, in Manchester, uh, and specializing in a type of chemistry called metabolomics. And, and Perdita contacted myself as a kind of academic neurologist specializing in Parkinson's disease. And we discussed whether we might be able to set up a study to see whether we could use skin swabs to diagnose Parkinson's disease, perhaps a lot earlier than is currently possible. We realized we'd need money and we realized it need to be a multi-center study. We applied for funding uh, and we're lucky enough to get funding both from Parkinson's UK and from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And so we set up a multi-center study to investigate this. I was kind of charged with setting up this study. And of course I had experience already from the Parkinson's pain study. So I knew how to set up a multi-center Parkinson study. Indeed, I could just contact the 25 centers that recruited best into the pain study and see if they wanted to be involved in this uh, study as well. And what we did in the study was take a skin swab on the areas that you can see on the picture there, just using a piece of gauze or using a Q-tip. And I'm going to present data on the first 64 participants here, but we've now got data on, on more than, than 2,000 uh, subjects. But this is the kind of the initial uh, data that we, that we published. So all the samples were taken, skin swabs, and then they were posted at room temperature to Manchester. So no kind of freezing or anything needed to be done. And then when got to Manchester, they were um, taken to uh, Perdita Baron's lab and they, she did a thing called metabolomics on these samples. And that basically means using fancy chemistry to identify all of the chemicals in the swabs using a technique called mass spectrometry. And then using fancy statistics to identify which chemicals are different in Parkinson's disease versus controls. And so when we do this, we found out that we could indeed diagnose Parkinson's disease simply from the skin swab. There was a clear difference in the chemical signature when you compare the uh, Parkinson's skin swabs from the control uh, skin swabs. And so we published our, our first paper on this last year in this chemistry journal, ACS Central Science. You may not have heard of this journal, but it is a, a high impact chemistry journal. It's got an impact factor of almost 13. So it's really up there with the kind of good uh, neuroscience and medical journals that we, that we publish in. So just before the uh, paper was published, the journal contacted us and, and they said they wanted to run a, a press release uh, because they thought there would be perhaps some media interest in our study. Uh, and it's quite funny when you're asked to do a press release, I've never been involved in this type of thing before, but you kind of sent a statement that you're supposed to have made. And of course you didn't say anything, but some, some kind of media guru that knows about these things has written it. And it's much better, much more erudite than anything that you would ever actually say. So you go, of course, yeah, that's great. You can, you can say, I said that if I did. And out goes this press release. 
And then the next thing, the whole world goes mad. I was really the, the center of a media storm after this. Um, the journal, about uh, a month or so after publication of the paper, after the press release, they contacted us to tell us about this here. This is what's called the Altmetric Attention Score. It's a kind of metric that the journals use to look at how much media interest there is in, uh, in individual papers. It looks at, for example, television, it looks at newspaper, radio, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that sort of thing. And it combines it all together to form a number. And the journal were quite excited because our study had an impact, uh, an altmetric score of 1133, which was the highest score this journal ever had. This was a, bear in mind, a high impact chemistry journal. They'd never been over a thousand before. So this was really a, a, a study that was, uh, had mass media interest. And for me, this all kind of culminated in an appearance on the BBC Breakfast so far. You can see myself in the picture here. And um, we've got Joy Mill and the super smeller beside me. And of course, Dan Walker and uh, Louise Minchin. We now, of course, have a bit more data. We uh, have recruited actually over 2,000 participants into this study now. And we have three further papers which have been submitted for publication on this much larger uh, number of participants. We have one paper which is currently in the revision stage at uh, ACS Central Science, the same journal that we published in before. We have one paper which is currently under review in Nature Genetics, and one paper which has recently been accepted by Nature Communications. So this really has been a, a great collaboration. Of course, all I've really done is, is organized the, the sample collection, and it's really the amazing work of, of Professor Barron and her lab, which have turned this into such a, a successful collaboration. Going forwards, what we want to try and do is look more early in the disease. We know that Parkinson's disease gradually, the process gradually spreads through the brain. Uh, and if we look at the uh, dopamine neurons over time, we can see that gradually over time, dopamine neur neurons will degenerate. If we look at clinical symptoms, they gradually come on over time. And at the moment, it turns out that you need to have about 70% loss of dopamine neurons before it becomes possible, before you develop symptoms, I should say, and then the diagnosis of Parkinson's is, able, is made. And what we want to do is use these skin swabs to try and diagnose Parkinson's much earlier. Remember, Joy could smell this, this, this smell, uh, uh, this musky smell, 12 years before Les developed any symptoms. So it does suggest that we may be able to diagnose Parkinson's much earlier using the uh, skin swabs. And we hope that will mean it will be much more easy to cure. If you think about curing cancer, if it spreads 70% around the body, it's gonna be pretty difficult to cure it. But if you can pick it up much earlier, then the cure becomes possible. And that's really the aim of uh, the, this uh, study uh, going forwards. So another kind of amazing thing that happened to me last year was that Professor Regina Katzenschlager and Professor Rob DeBee uh, contacted me and asked me uh, if I would uh, join the World Parkinson and Movement Disorders Evidence-Based uh, Medicine Committee. This committee uh, has got 25 people on it from all around the world. And basically there's some of the world experts in Parkinson's and Movement Disorders, and they produced evidence-based medicine reviews and guidelines uh, which are then used by all of the uh, other kind of countries in the world. Uh, and I was really honored to be asked to be one of only two uh, UK representatives uh, on this committee. And it's been a privilege for me to kind of join meetings uh, with these people, albeit virtually, and discuss the kind of development of these uh, new guidelines. So I think towards the end of the talk, I wanna just maybe give a little bit of advice for any kind of budding clinical academics, anybody, who may want to kind of look at a similar type of, of career pathway uh, to myself. And the two pieces of advice I would give you uh, would be firstly, collaboration. I think this is absolutely key. Um, it's, it's really difficult to do this yourself, especially when you're largely on a clinical contract. Uh, so don't try and do it all yourself. Collaboration is absolutely key. There's loads of people at the university who want to collaborate with us. Uh, and they will contact you once you become known as an academic. And of course, you can find out what people at the university are doing and, and see who's got interests similar to yourself and contact them. And loads of collaborations will, will, will arise from this. And that really is the key, I think, of being a successful clinical academic. And the other important thing is don't worry too much about spreading yourself quite thin. 
I think if you're a pure academic, probably you want to focus in one specific area. But if you're a clinical academic, then actually I think it's quite good to spread yourself quite thin and have lots of different projects on the go. Remember a few years ago, I was a little bit worried that I might be doing too many different projects. And I spoke to Bill Ollier, who um, at the time was the head of R&D at Salford. I, I asked him if he thought I was doing too much. And he said, not at all. Spreading yourself thin is, is absolutely the key to success as a clinical academic. And as long as you feel that you've got some control over the projects that you're involved with, I think that is a, is a good thing. And this clearly was good advice because if it hadn't been for this advice, then a little while later when I got this email about this crazy woman who thought she could smell Parkinson's disease, I'd probably have ignored the email. But luckily I didn't ignore it and it's become really one of my most successful uh, collaborations. So in the final slide, I wanna just talk about the future of academic neurology here in Manchester. I think now that I've been appointed to a mask chair, I see myself as having responsibility, not just to my own research, but to really trying to drive forward academic neurology research in Manchester. And I really don't think that the universities or indeed Salford Royal realize quite what a potential academic gold mine we're sitting on here in the neurology department in Salford Royal. Because we are quite frankly, one of the biggest neurology departments in the whole world. I don't say this lightly. We have a catchment area of over 3 million people. We have one huge neurology unit covering that whole catchment area with over 37 consultant neurologists. So this officially makes us the biggest neurology department in the UK. And if you look in Europe, if you look in the States, other cities with 3 million population or above, almost all of them you'll see have loads of different neurology units scattered all over the place, not really talking to each other. We have one huge unit, 37 consultants, all in one place covering this massive population. So we really do have a larger and more varied number of people with neurological conditions coming through our department than almost any other uh, neurology department in the world. And these patients would love to be involved in research. They tell us this all the time. And uh, of course, we have in Manchester three large universities with loads of uh, academics in neuroscience and related specialties. And they would love to collaborate with us. They would love to have access to our patients. And so really, we should be one of the most successful academic neurology units in the world. But it's not working at the moment. And the reason is that we don't have clinical academics. And by clinical academics in neurology, I mean somebody who is funded roughly 75% of their time by Salford Royal. I think it has to be 75%, roughly that amount, in order to spend that amount of time clinically, to have the clinical skills, the clinical knowledge, the access to patients to be a successful clinical academic. And then the other 25% of the time funded by the universities in order to have protected time to spend on academic research. So you can write papers, you can write grant applications, you can supervise PhD students, you can go to meetings at the universities and so on. And if we look at the successful um, academic neurology units in the UK, places like Sheffield, like Newcastle, like Queen Square, what you will find is roughly one third of their consultant neurologists are on clinical academic contracts like this. If you look in Manchester, the largest in the UK, one of the largest in the world, out of 37 consultant neurologists, I'm actually the only non-stroke neurologist who has any protected academic time in their contract. And hopefully over the last 25 minutes or so, I've been able to show you what can be achieved by one person who has one day's protected academic time per week in order to devote to research uh, what, can be, what can be achieved in this huge kind of neurology center. If we could just over the next few years increase up to perhaps four or five clinical academics in neurology with protected time, and then move forward perhaps 10 to 15 years, given the size and scope of our unit and the size and scope of the universities here in Manchester, we really could be one of the preeminent neurology, academic neurology departments in the world. So hope if anybody from the university or Salford Royal is listening to this talk, you can help to work with me to make this a reality. Thank you.